So the way we're going to organize this is I've got some questions for Jeff. Uh, I was going to give to him for about uh, 20 minutes, half an hour. Then we're going to open up to more of a free-flowing uh, conversation. He's got some questions. And then uh, at the end, about a half hour of Q&A with the audience. Okay? So um, the title of this event tonight is, uh, you know, are, are we going to be all right? Uh, race in uh, the age of Trump. So I, I didn't want to say this because every interview I heard with you on the radio in the fall after the elections, the, the, the journalist had to say, are we going to be all right? Um, but what do we do with race in the Trump era? What do, what are, tell us we're going to be all right. <laughs> Save us. Uh, no, I, I can't save us, but uh, but we all could save ourselves, I guess. But for, first of all, just thank you. Um, it's it's actually we haven't seen each other for a super long time, Thanks and we spent a lot. Of, yeah, so we spent a lot of time together in in um, our our younger years and stuff. So I, I'm really really happy to be here. Thank you so much for the, for the invitation, and it's really nice to be here at Sac State. I um, took classes here actually. Uh, as a uh, as a young person working over in the legislature, and just have a lot of fun memories of Sacramento. I'm just really super happy to be here, so thank you. Um, yeah, so I wrote this book, right, and I called it "We Gonna Be All Right." Obviously, after the Kendrick Lamar song, and and then I woke up on November 9th like everybody else did. <laughs> That's the same question to myself: like, are we gonna be all right? And um, and I had to rep that. I had to kind of, you know, I had this book that I had put out, and um, and you know, the the book came from looking at um, a lot of the ways in which race has and racial justice um, had um, fallen off the radar for so many decades, but then was pushed back to the center of the American discourse by the movement for Black Lives, and. So the book was in, in, in many ways sort of, um, you know, a reaction uh, to that from um, a personal and sort of a intellectual kind of point of view, but also a very visceral point of view, because these are issues that I've been working on and so many of us have been working on for so many years. And I think during our lifetimes especially, we've mainly seen backlash around race. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm talking about in the book is that there's a, a cycle of crisis around race. That there's, you know, there's an event, a precipitating event. There's a crisis um, that happens, and then there's a reaction to that, right? And then out of that, there's a backlash that gets formed. And in this backlash and this sort of pushing back and forth, people just get very exhausted and sort of leave it alone for a little bit, and then we find ourselves, of course, in another crisis. And so we've been through this sort of cycle every generation since since we've been born, you know, since the 1960s, um, we've come of age in the post-civil rights era. And so Who We Be, the book that came before that, was attempting to try to look at this half century through visual culture and to, and to think about specifically the ways that we see race, how it's changed and has not changed. And and as we got to, the book came out in 2014, came out in the fall, and as we got to the, the latter months of the year, there was the non-indictment of Officer Dan Wilson and the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. And suddenly, um, after the non-indictment, um, the movement moved to a whole higher level. Um, and so, so much kind of needed to be appended to that book. Um, so much needed to be Processed, I think, um, and and that's where we gonna be all right kind of came from, and the the song of course has become an anthem right for the movement all across the country and all around the world, and it's a song that's very much you know ninety percent of the lyrics are about being in the struggle about Kendrick Lamar describing what it means to be a young black man growing up in South Los Angeles, and yet out of that. <clears throat> Out of this daily struggle, he pulls these lyrics, you know, if, if basically saying like, if you got me, if I've got you, if if God's got us, then we're gonna be all right. And seeing people in the street, you know, chanting that, that amidst all of the pressure, amidst all of the 
racism amidst all of the intensification, militarization, the brutality that collective power might be a, a way to, to move us to a new day. Um, that was incredibly inspiring and continues to be. And so, you know, I, I, I had a couple of moments, I think between November and January 21st, you know, where I just was very much in despair. But I, what I think has happened now is that social movements are thinking a lot more about what the intersections are. I think in previous decades, we would often fight with each other, and it would be a type of thing where it'd be like, well, it's class, no, it's race, or it's, it's both, but really, it's actually just class, or you know what I mean, like these kinds of debates. And what I saw was a sense of um, people thinking about where the intersections could occur. And so, with the, with the Women's March, the Unity Principles, you know, there was a debate at the beginning. Well, what does environmental justice have to do with feminist issues? What does racial justice have to do with feminist issues? Um, what what are these different types of, what does economic justice have to do with feminist issues? And, and folks saying, these are feminist issues, you know? And the same thing with the Dreamers, right? And the same thing with uh, folks in Standing Rock. And the same thing with folks uh, fighting around climate justice. And the same thing with folks uh, in the movement for black lives, you know, showing up for each other, um, finding what the intersections could be, and and then seeing these explosions happening at the airports when the Muslim van comes down, um, at, you know, in the streets, um, all around the country, um, and and thinking that we've actually reached a moment, in some ways, of maturation that we haven't been in, maybe for the last 50 years, where people can begin to imagine what, what it might look like to pull together, pull in a world that we haven't actually stepped into. Mm -hmm. so. I mean, so one of the things I was struck with with the book, and um, especially the, there's an essay on gentrification in the greater Bay Area, um, on resegregation, and how unstoppable some of those um, de facto processes of racial resegregation are. And I'm just wondering what you think of, I mean, you, have, you find this optimism in looking at the social movements and organization, and how can that go up against the, the, the portrait of this really depressing, oppressive, uh, social economic pattern of cities being torn apart by gentrification? Well, it's a dialectic. It's not like you're like you're really happy and then you're really optimistic and then you're really sad and you're really pessimistic. I think it's like part of just you know being in the world and in life and being engaged and sort of being in struggle, right? Working with other people around these types of questions. And so, you know, the 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 work that I was trying to do, you know, despite the the optimistic title, sort of optimistic title, whatever. Um, is was to actually expose re resegregation as the condition of our time that's been underexamined, um, and that this should happen during an Obama administration um, is historically ironic. But it's also um, it also gave us, I think, uh, the opportunity to be able to see things for what they really were and really are, and and so in in that respect, it's it's. It's less a, a sort of pendulum swing of mood than it's sort of an approach to to, to recognizing that these are these are these are the real conditions that we deal with, and yet we still need to find a way to be able to wake up in the morning and, and, and get to work on these kinds of things. And so, um, you know, for for me, thinking about resegregation came from moments of joy. Um, living in Berkeley, for instance, or or being in Oakland. And hearing these, you know, jams, these hyphy jams, like around the turn of the millennium, and then coming to realize these aren't being made in East Oakland or West Oakland or the Fillmore or that kind of thing anymore. They're being made like up the 80 corridor in Fairfield, you know, up here, Sacramento, like in Vallejo, and, and that kind of thing. And then thinking about this expanded map of of the Bay and thinking about the the ways in which you know, the, the decimation of the black communities in San Francisco and Oakland, um, you know, um, has still, it, it's, it's, 
it, it's there's a way to write it as a really negative type of story, but people always will find a way to be creative, and people will always find a way to speak to you know uh, each other, and and so that made me think about space and place and and what was happening, um, but it was through this, these moments of joy, you know, and I think that that's that's part of 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 what we can kind of recognize in, in all of this that we still have amidst all of all of these crushing types of um, conditions uh, the the ability to be able to to be creative to be able to have the agency to to, um, to make uh, this new world that we keep on trying to to will to gain. I, just, I think that that essay on resegregation is just so brilliant, especially the way you, you blend uh, sort of a cultural portrait of early Millennium Bay Area uh, youth culture with a really good um, uh, presentation of the sociological uh, and demographic changes of gentrification in the Bay Area and the Googleization. And combined with, as a, as a journalist, your really great human vignettes. And I just, uh, the, the one line that really stuck out in my head was the, um, the image of the, um, the, uh, the pickup game on the soccer field that's been going on for generations for Mexican-American kids in the city, and they're getting pushed aside by a bunch of Google execs with a permit for uh, an authorized soccer game, and just that transformation of the city. Yeah, the, I mean, that's sort of, you know, we've, been, uh, we've been having a lot of these conversations um, and, and, and that's sort of the way, these are the ways in which they kind of take shape, right? These sort of little micro moments um, in which people realize, oh, the community that we thought we were living in is not the community that we're living in anymore. Um, and so another moment, of course, is, is when um, people who have been drumming at Lake Merritt, you know, this happened like late, late um, uh, not last year, but the year before, uh, people have been drumming there, African drumming for, and not like like the sort of like, you know, sort of whack, sort of, you know, uh, sort of incense type of circle where people are just not, sort of- Not in Santa Cruz? Blah, blah. This is like- You want to say not in Santa Cruz, right? Yeah, I was gonna, I, I didn't want to, but you did, so. We know, we know. <laughs> but I mean like, like an African drumming circle that's been going on for decades at Lake Merritt, suddenly being interrupted by police because um, new folks who live in the neighborhood don't want to hear drumming on, on their weekend, you know? Um, or during the week in West Oakland, um, people not wanting to hear uh, church choirs singing their hymns of praise practicing for Sunday morning um, because they just want to be, you know, in there with their Netflix and, you know, whatever, this is interrupting them. So, like these noise complaints, literally these noise complaints, uh, were ways in which people started realizing, oh, this, this is not what, you know, what, what this is not the city that we thought we were living in. Um, and and to folks' credit, that you know, like artists, anti-displacement um, activists, um, organizers have all been coming together around saying, no, this is actually the character of, 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 of Oakland, of the East Bay, and, uh, and, and so let's, let's work, let's deal with that. Let's, 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 let's uh, make that real. Um, so, you know, there are all these different types of things that are, that are happening, um, but, you know, a lot of it is, is sort of suffused in silence. When people are displaced, and this is why I think gentrification is such a, it's too small a word, right? When people are displaced, they're gone. And gentrification as a frame for that centers the wealth that's moving in. And it erases the people that are pushed out. Um, and, and so I, I just think that gentrification is part of this larger um, process of resegregation that's going on. And that's what we've seen. Um, that's why you, you see George Zimmerman in Sanford, Florida and not in uh, Miami, right? That's why you see Officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson. Um, and on the flip side, that's why we see, um, you know, communities building up in, in Ferguson, in Sanford, in, you know, in places all around the country. Um, that's, these are the processes that have 
that have uh, occurred, and they've been largely invisible until these flashpoints um, have happened over the last few years. So uh, one of the essays is entitled, Is Diversity for White People? And you at this position, uh, Executive Director of Center for Diversity in the Arts. Yeah. You want to talk, can you talk about the thesis of uh, is diversity for white people and, and, and how this relates to universities? Because your, yeah. your description of um, university diversity efforts was really enlightening. I, so yeah, I, thank you for that. I, I do run a program called the Institute for Diversity in the Arts. Um, and I did write an essay called Is Diversity for White People? And I, uh, and I, you know, I, and, and, and my problem isn't with diversity. Um, I, I love and value diversity of every kind of, of, of in every kind of way. And I, I think that actually um, there are ways for us to think about um, biodiversity as a, a good metaphor for thinking about how diversity um, could work in the best case, best case scenario. But what I think has happened over the last 50 years in particular is that notions of diversity have been separated from notions of equity. And because of that separation, there's been this sort of fetishization of diversity um, at the same time that conditions that uh, continue to enforce racial inequity have been allowed to grow and, and ex become exacerbated. Um, so we could talk Kendall Jenner, but we won't. Um, <laughs> but that's sort of what I'm trying to, trying to talk about, you know, is this sort of picture of diversity that sells things, right? That can sell a, a sweet drink, or that can sell um, a, a university, right? A college, or that kind of thing. And so Nancy Leon has this idea of racial capitalism in which she's talking about how universities, corporations, individuals gain a lot of capital by being able to invoke diversity. Um, and yet, we could still look at, you know, the inequities that obtain from <coughs> housing to schooling to uh, health equity, uh, all the way into the, into the popular culture. Um, you know, bringing in the Grammys or Oscars so white or any of these other kinds of things, and and see that there has been not a lot of change um, structurally, right, um, to to these to to the to to the, the the sort of institutions that actually you know allow power to to or that enforce power, um, and that allow people to be able to to uh, either accumulate power and hoard it or to distribute power. Um, it's still uh, a situation in which power has not been redistributed in the ways that we were expecting that it might be after the Civil Rights Revolution. Um, and this, this is still a struggle. So, repairing, like literally repairing, putting back together diversity and equity was, is, is sort of what we should be looking for. Um, and, and, and moving away from this sort of, you know, surface level, um, you know, everybody's going to be a minority, sort of happy, um, like have a coke officer, you know, type of diversity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, have a, have a Pepsi, okay. Have a Pepsi officer, yes. Type of, type of way of looking at the world, yeah. I mean, that's just, I'm just sort of yeah. illustrating the bankruptcy of, of Coke and, and Pepsi. I mean, because Coke did it a few years ago as well, um, uh, the Super Bowl, you know. They had, a, they had an ad in which they, they featured um, these images of, of uh, people across the U.S. And it was just the most beautiful uh, set of images I've ever seen. A, a young woman in a hijab, um, you know, uh, a group of, uh, of, of young um, migrants, you know, hanging out, um, playing music for each other. And then at the end, there's like Coke that comes in, and you're just like, ah, I feel so dirty. <laughs> But you know, this is what I'm talking about. And you've, you have, you've written about this previously in, yeah. um, in Who We Be on uh, the Benetton ads. Yeah, the Benetton and you ads. deliver a really nice critique of the Benetton ads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that, again, that, that racial capitalism? Yeah, racial capitalism at work, absolutely. You know? and, and, so, um, and so, you know, the, the, the thing is, you know, so about two, you know, about two years ago now, we had a lot of student protests that were, that were going on across the country. 
And, and everybody wanted to talk about it as a free speech issue, right? <clears throat> that by suddenly taking to the quads, students were somehow shutting down the free speech of, of universities and institutions, um, and, and people that, that were saying that there, that there wasn't any racism on the campus. Um, I, I've, I, I noted that it was a free speech of those who were saying that there wasn't any racism on campuses. Because it takes a lot for folks to be able to actually rise up and say there is something happening here. People have to overcome silence in order, in order to do that. But my point is, is that these, the, the, that students were rising up because they've been sold this bill of goods. Like, if you come to this university, it'll be a diverse campus and we'll be able to see everybody interacting in a really nice kind of a way. It's gonna just be a wonderful sort of multi-culti paradise uh, with everybody dressed in whatever clothing and drinking Pepsi. But it's, it's, it's a situation in which students were calling out the gap between that and the actual experiences that they were, that they were feeling on the campuses. And, um, and I think that, you know, that that's an ongoing type of, of question. And that's something that, that bridges even to our generation, that when we were on campus, there were a lot of, our generation was up in protest around the same kinds of questions. If you looked at the actual demands of the students during those years, like less than a handful, something like a handful of colleges asked for, for changes to, to speech codes. Mm -hmm. The overwhelming majority of campuses were asking for more uh, cultural sensitivity, more diversity training, more faculty and staff of color. Um, they were asking for institutional changes that have not been made uh, in the 20 plus years since the term campus climate was invented. Um, and so this is again another kind of example of the gap between the picture of diversity and the reality of inequity. Um, I want to read a, a quick section from the book. I can hold, hold the book and the microphone at the same time. Um, and this is about talking about race. And in the uh, What a Time to Be Alive chapter, you write, uh, I've written elsewhere that while we are engaged in the culture wars, the most difficult thing to do is to keep the quote race conversation going, because it is pol because its polarizing mod modalities are better at teaching us what not to say to each other than what to say, better at closing off conversation than starting it. Could you, could you expand on that? Yeah, it was there was a part actually in Huey B. There was a section in Huey B. Um, about political correctness that I rewrote for eight years. I re I wrote the book for eight years, and during the entire period that I was writing it, I was rewriting this one section um, about political correctness, which is ironic because political correctness essentially is a way, using the term political correctness, I think is a way of silencing people who want to call out um, racism, who want to call out um, you know, sexism, who want to call out uh, homophobia, who want to call out these different types of um, you know, things that are coming up. And, and, and somebody just says, oh, well, you're just being politically correct, you know, and that's a way of saying, I'm not really buying what it is that you're saying, and, and we're gonna put that off in that category over there, but we can continue to ignore it. And so I rewrote this, trying to modulate it for about eight years, trying to find exactly the right tone to do that. And, and the, the irony, of, of course, of, of doing that strikes me now, you know? Um, but it made me, it did make me think, like, in so many ways, what, what, we, what happened, I think, during the 1980s was you had, a gen, you had our generation coming of age that were the beneficiaries of the Civil Rights Revolution. And so we ended up coming to the campuses in much more diverse numbers and much larger numbers of diversity than anybody had ever expected. And this posed a challenge, actually, to university administrators um, immediately. Like, how do you deal with this? How do you make uh, something of this? You know, like, people are bringing with them their stereotypes, they're bringing with them their um, sort of prejudices, and it's playing out in the dorms, in the cafeterias, on the, in, the, in the classroom, um, everywhere. And, uh, and so these were actually very tense years. And, uh, incidents of hate violence had spiked during the 80s and the 90s, and this was a type of situation in which folks were trying to figure out how to get a handle on it. Um, and, and so the, 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 the way that folks sort of uh, began to deal with it was that activists, student activists would demand, you know, that there be more 
uh, attention to these kinds of questions. And, and so a whole sort of infrastructure gets developed during the 80s and 90s. Cultural centers get developed, multiculturalism kind of gets installed as, as sort of the, the reigning kind of ideology. And, and, and in some ways, from an administrative point of view, it's thinking about how to manage these sort of different groups. Um, and, and so, you know, each, so to each group their own type of thing. And, uh, and within that, um, there's an there's a increased sort of sensitivity to things that were formerly considered, ah, we just say chink all the time, or whatever. We say oriental all the time. Can't do that now, right? Um, and so, instead we learned, like, all these things that people, like, would prefer not to have. Right? And what that did was it, it made it possible for folks to begin to have conversations because now you actually reset the bounds of civility, right? And that's exactly what those protests, that's exactly what those types of um, trainings, that's exactly what all those things are supposed to do, right? Um, but then how do you begin to have a conversation around these kinds of things? And I think that within that, that's the that's the point that we've we've ended up kind of struggling with, you know, um, over the last several decades. And so Donald Trump comes along, and he just says anything he wants to, right? Um, grab him by the P, like all this kind of stuff that harkened to this pre-PC era, and it, he feels like to some people as if he's giving people freedom again, right? But that's not how you move forward. Right? If you have people that you're trying to live with, you figure out a new way to be able to discuss things with each other. But then you've got to have a conversation. Right? And so the discussion really needs to move to the question of equity. And I think that that's where the conversation is stalled. Right? And, and I think that that's, that's basically the, the, the dead end that, has, that, that was reached in some ways at the beginning of the Obama administration. When we were like, oh, we're post racial now. We've actually leapfrogged beyond all this kind of stuff. Well, no, we've just begun to actually have a conversation about what inequities look like and how to really get at them. Um, and, and so, in some ways, the fact that we've entered into this backlash period right now um, is it's, it's deeply disappointing, right? I think to all of us here. Um, but at the same time, We've, we've, we do have to recognize that we've been able to move this conversation to this particular place. It's just that we have to be able to figure out the ways to open those conversations up in different types of ways. And I think that that's what social movements have been doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I want you to say a few words on um, one of the points you make about defining racism as increasing the chance of premature death for certain people and certain groups and... Um, yeah, this is Ruth Wilson Gilmore's um, formulation of racism. And, and so it's thinking about uh, racism as, as the power to determine uh, different groups' um, susceptibility to premature death. And so when we think about the words Black Lives Matter, that's what we're really getting at, right? We're, we're really getting at the heart of the question here, which is that inequality has grown for all Americans, absolutely. Um, but the deepest and most enduring uh, inequalities are along racial lines, and they literally come down to life expectancy. They literally come down to premature death, the biggest gaps between whites and blacks there. And that's what it means when, when, when we say Black Lives Matter. It comes down to that. The, the, uh, the only groups that sort of are um, comparable in that respect are Native American groups in some categories. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so I think that, that Ruth was, you know, Ruth has done a lot of work around prisons and looking at, especially the California prisons, as, as um, a laboratory for what's happened with incarceration all across the board. Um, but I think that that, that particular um, idea 
is really central to, to the notion of where we need to be able to go as a country in order to, to move towards racial justice and mend these kinds of historic um, gaps that, that uh, have been established. Um, in order to, to, to have the U.S. get right, this is the main thing that we have to address and overcome. And I think that, again, that's sort of why the intervention of the movement for Black Lives has been so crucial um, over the last three, four years. Yeah. Um, I, thought, I thought the essay uh, in the book on Ferguson was really one of the more powerful and really thoughtful pieces um, I read on Ferguson. I know, I know you wrote it with the year uh, time um, after the uh, initial murder. Um, what, what did you want to accomplish with that, with that piece? And also, um, you want to talk about your time in Ferguson? Um, I know you're there on the anniversary. Yeah, so, uh, sure. Um, I, I went to Ferguson, um, as many people did, um, to, to bear witness. I, I went there as a writer, um, as, a, as a reporter, as somebody um, who um, was very deeply sympathetic to um, the cause, obviously. And, um, and I was really um, moved by, by the, the resistance that folks have been able to form. When I got there, it was, a, it was for the year anniversary of the killing of Michael Brown. And at that point, it was the longest continuous protest in US history since the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, and there was also, um, similar to the Montgomery bus boycott, this very deep sort of, and I know that you had Cornell West here um, recently, but there was this very deep um, sense of, of a spiritual kind of foundation to the, to the movement um, that I was really actually surprised about. Um, from, you know, the older folks, the, the grandmothers and the grandfathers and, you know, aunties and uncles all the way down to the young folks. Um, and it didn't necessarily always take the form of organized religion. In fact, a lot of organized churches um, were felt like the the young uh, organizers, the young protesters, uh, were out of hand, actually, out of pocket. But for folks there, it was it, 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 there was a, a sense of a larger kind of purpose that sort of was bigger. Right? And, and one of the things they say is Ferguson is everywhere. And I think that this is absolutely true. You know, and I think that this is the, the key sort of takeaway for me in, in, in thinking about writing about resegregation, thinking about how Ferguson is everywhere. Um, but the, the piece um, was, I, I, I interviewed a ton of people. I, I got to spend time observing the protests. I got arrested. Um, as, as part of this sort of, it's just the way that St. Louis County um, uh, police deal with things there. They arrest everybody. Um, they arrested, you know, women who are coming back from chemotherapy, who are there to be legal observers. They arrested elderly people. They arrested journalists. Um, they arrested everybody. Um, and, and that was sort of part of the, the thing as well. It was, Recognizing, um, you know, that one couldn't stand on the sidelines, that uh, one had to kind of take a stand, you know. Um, they brought back the old sort of coal miners uh, to, you know, which side are you on uh, in St. Louis. They brought that song back, and it was so true. And I've grown up around police. My mom worked for the police department in Hawaii. Um, and never encountered police of that kind of uh, of level of brutality and stupidity, I could say that, that I did there in St. Louis County. Um, and so that was that was the emotional urgency to, to write, I think, for, for, for that particular chapter and also for the for, for the book as a as a whole of um, for your next project. Uh, uh, Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee. What, um, why Bruce Lee? Um, I, well, I, I, I know why. But. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. I mean, who wouldn't, right? I, 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 got, I got asked to do it by an editor um, in, uh, in, the, in the publishing industry, and 
I took about 30 seconds to say yes. And, but you know, I, it's, it's uh, he's sort of the gig gigantic sort of towering figure in Asian America, I think, you know? Um, uh, and so grappling kind of with his legacy is, and he, he lived so much in 32 years. Um, it's, it's amazing to me that he only lived 32 years, um, that there's so much there to be talked about. There's the migration story. There's the story of his life being um, set in the context of war, you know, um, uh, and and uh, and then there's the the countercultural piece, you know, which it, it, I think anybody who lives in California, um, who really loves California, at some point falls in love with, and and also is very scared of the countercultural impulse here. Um, knowing what we know about the history of countercultures, but the Pacific sort of counterculture, and how it edges and how Asia edges into that, and how you know the Pacific sort of constitutes itself. There's all of that in the story, as well as this epic sort of story of of overcoming um, bigotry and prejudice um, in this sort of wiry, 125 pound, you know, five foot nine like ball of like fire and muscle and speed. So, yeah. So I, I can't. I can't wait to actually. It's going to take a long time. I can't mess that up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, can I ask you some questions? Yeah. Actually? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the thing to know is that that, that Michael and I grew up in Honolulu, Hawaii, and um, our professor Van. I, sh I should refer to Dr. Van. Professor Van. <laughs> like dude and and um and part of i think part of the way that that we think about race was really shaped by growing up in in hawaii so people always ask me about that you know and i i sometimes give them sort of the the whatever the sort of there's a there's a happy answer and there's a more detailed answer that sort of happy answer is the rainbow connection sort of you know whatever type of, you know, picture, stereotype people have about folks from Hawaii being, you know, able to get along and being nicer generally yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But I really wanted to ask you, like, how you, how races, how growing up in Hawaii, born and raised, right, as a Holly guy, as a white guy in Hawaii, shaped your path to thinking about the work that you do now. We, 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 so the backstory is we had a phone conversation on Monday about this, and he got really deep, and I said, you know, I think that my professional career has kind of been my own therapy for growing up Holly in Hawaii and like unpacking white racism, and I, I do it with the French in Vietnam because American history is just too close and Hawaiian history is too close. But it was, you know, it's like, like you said, it's this weird, Hawaii is this weird paradox of on the one hand, um, Racial utopia, very enlightened, very very mixed, very progressive in so many ways, especially in the, the state power structure, uh, economic and political. Um, yet on the other hand, the realities of uh, on the street in Hawaii in the 70s and into the 80s um, were really rough and really violent. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of my earliest memories are uh, very intense random acts of violence. Uh, uh, against uh, older white men that were father figures to me. So my dad coming home from surfing with a black eye because mm -hmm. he, uh, somebody, a local guy had dropped it on him. We should probably give you a vocabulary lesson. <laughs> I'm Howley, he stay local. <laughs> well, you, you're local Howley. Local Howley, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. uh, yeah. is an oxymoron, it is and isn't, but uh, <laughs> Howley is Howley's Hawaiian for stranger and white guy. And then there's a divide between mainland Howley's and local Howley's and whatnot. And then local, in the uh, Hawaiian lexicon is um, non-white, but not necessarily every native Hawaiian. Hawaiian. Every yeah. Hawaiian is local. Every Hawaiian is local, but not, but every, not every local, local is, is Hawaiian. Hawaiian. Yeah. You guys yeah. with us? Yeah. We're going to have a Hawaii race flow chart for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Venn, Venn diagrams. Venn diagram. Uh, Venn diagram. Venn diagram. <laughs> Venn diagram. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's my, some of my earliest memories are uh, my dad came with a black eye for being out surfing and having a local guy drop it on him and my dad saying someone's getting punched. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, one of my dad's friends driving me around, and this this was a really heavy moment, uh, down by Publix in Waikiki, a surf spot, and this was a Howley guy from the mainland, so he doesn't know what he's supposed to do. We pull into this parking lot at 5 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, and there's a bunch of guys with green beer bottles, so they've been drinking for a while, and um, uh, one of them says, hey, Howley, and uh, starts walking over to the car, and I was like, let's get out of here, let's get out of here, I'm about 10 years old. And he says, what? Which is, which is the, the precursor to a fight, saying, right. saying right. what to a stranger who's just called right. you Howley. Right. And the guy just reaches in the, in the car and just cocks him in the face. Mm -hmm. Really yeah. hard, splits his eye open, his glass, he's wearing glasses, they wind up in my lap, and laughs, walks away. And the guy's gonna laugh. And um, uh, the guy was stunned, my dad's buddy was stunned, and, and, and concerned for me, this is a 10 year old kid right here. And we drove off, and my memory, is being so angry with him for not knowing what to do, mm -hmm. for you know, apologizing for being there and not just getting out of there. And you know, in hindsight, it's like, that is, that's not anything to put on a 10-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. um, these weird, you know, uh, obviously the post-colonial legacy is uh, Hawaii and the uh, institutional racism with the plantations and so forth, but then, the reality on the streets of just these random acts of violence that were really quite common in late 70s, early 80s. At the same time, coinciding with uh, the real joy around sort of that second Hawaiian Renaissance yeah. mm -hmm. and memories of Eddie Aikau and the Hokulea, mm -hmm. the, which was the Polynesian um, uh, voyaging society. We created a Polynesian boat to take, uh, they sailed to Tahiti and back. That big scene in Moana, like, that's from the Hokulea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's basically it. Yeah, it's Nainoa Thompson and hopefully they are yeah, yeah. going across the ocean again. Yeah, but at the same time, there, at the same time, there'd be this really inclusive yeah. sense of joy in Hawaiian identity. Exactly. Yeah. And um, it's a tough one to figure out. Yeah. It's hard, but you know, it's the thing that's really interesting to me is you know the so demographically we're all headed in this direction. California is already there, right? And and part of part of the thing that people ask me is like. So I get approached a lot in terms of, because I guess whatever, I'm the, I'm the race guy now or whatever, right? So, you know, I was the hip hop guy and now I'm the race guy, I don't know. So people, you know, especially white folks come up to me and they're sort of like, so what, like, what, what do we do? Like, what do, we do? And I always want to be like, I want you, I want you to talk to my homie here and like some other friends of mine, you know, like, what does it mean to grow up as, as a minority with white privilege, but also like not necessarily class privilege? And growing up in a, I mean, but you know, like growing up in a, in a society that is gonna be mixed, you know, in, in which racism has not been um, eradicated, in which institutional racism is real, um, and in which violence is, you know, is, is part of the staple norm of, of how people interact with each other, you know? And that's partly why. Yeah. So if you could answer that in five, oh, yeah, five, five yeah, words yeah, of that. So. Well, we <laughs> um, but the, um, the, the memoir that won the Pulitzer Prize this year for memoirs uh, by Ben Finnegan, um, Barbarian Days, a, a Surfing Life. It's a book about surfing. But the opening chapter, I swear, it's, it's like someone was looking over my shoulder because the guy was uh, um, an elementary, student, elementary school student and middle school student in my neighborhood. And it was probably the most accurate description of, of being Howley in Oahu in the, in the 70s and just absolutely, in this weird, again, this weird combination of the Hawaiian ideal, uh, this racial melting pot, with some of the realities on the street. Mm -hmm. yeah. You want to talk about Kill Howley Day? Yeah, you said Kill Howley Day and uh, it's a myth. It's a myth. There was, well, it wasn't it was a week. It was a week. It was a week. <laughs> was a week. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's funny, like the, the fact that we can actually talk about this and laugh about it now. But the thing is, is is I feel like it's so crucial to to thinking about like how we make it through the next you know, and, and in so many ways like we were raised to think, especially in, I think in, in coming up here, because I know as you got here to California and I got here to California. We both ended up being involved in activism and around the arts, uh, especially, and, and thinking about race through the arts and, and culture. We can kind of talk about that too. Um, but like trying to think about sort of how people develop 
modes, like this goes back to the question around the conversation around race, right? Like sort of what are what what people can't say and what people can say, and how people find the conversation and find figure out belonging within that, figure out how they belong to each other, figure out community and those kinds of things. Well, you know, one of the things I think that you're reflecting on the experience taught me was the importance of history and yeah. why why I picked this as my career path. Mm -hmm. and understanding the historical context of what I was raised in. It's always a weird place. It's got American history. It's, it's an unusual, very unusual situation that can't be understood without a serious discussion of American empire and colonialism, settler colonialism, the legacy of, colonialism, legacy of the plantation system in the Pacific, uh, which just wasn't really talked about. Uh, in the 70s with that second Hawaiian Renaissance, it was starting to come in, but it wasn't, it wasn't fully integrated into curriculum discussion. I mean, we were, so our, our, our generation was probably the last, gen, last period in Hawaii in the public schools where there was no Hawaiian language instruction. Yeah, there was right. no Hawaiian language instruction. And, and older folks, probably, your, probably people your parents' age, will tell stories about getting uh, hit with a ruler in public schools for speaking the Hawaiian language. That's right. I mean, like, like state censor effort to eradicate a, a culture, uh, a language. And then, I don't, you probably know better than I do, but after, about when we graduated and after, they started the Hawaiian language programs. And now when you go back, there's high school kids who can speak Hawaiian. Which is mind blowing. Uh, yeah, my, my nephews and, and nieces are part of that generation. And, and so culturally, they have a whole different sense of self. Um, and I don't know if that I don't know how that translates for for kids who are not of Hawaiian background, um, but yeah, it's it's amazing. It's really powerful. And just having having that culture be revived, right? Just really changes it, and, and it's, I think it's an incredible anecdote antidote to the um, to the historic silencing of empire and silencing of Hawaiian culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's, it's like completely changed. It's, it's completely different. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's happened in our lifetime. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to ask that because I just, you know, it feels like this is a, a, a vibrant question, a real live question now. And it, it leads me to so much, to think so much about resegregation. It also leads me to think about like culture and, you know, that like hip hop. You know, so, so for me, you know, um, thinking about hip hop, um, in the late '80s into the '90s, was a way to um, was a way to try to find sort of a pan ethnic or pan racial kind of place. I guess thinking about it now, you know, I know you're really involved too in you know music and surf culture and all those kinds of things. And I was wondering if you like had any kind of analogs as well, trying to find kind of the, the place a place for for yourself when you. Came up to California in the 20s and 30s and that kind of thing. <laughs> I don't know how much I want to reveal. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, it was so I, I showed up at Santa Cruz in the mid 1980s, and one of the first things I said was, Look at all the howlers, look at all the white people. Um, and then immediately got hit with Santa Cruz localism. Mm -hmm. And um, yet again, there was this, this real hostility towards the university students and so forth. And um, I think it was it was it was like sort of a doubly alienating experience. A certain degree of alienation being you know, how they came to Hawaii, and then um, being transplanted to Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz locals are really good at making that clear that you you're not from where you didn't go to high school. So you no, know, surfing wasn't an avenue for that. But, uh, <laughs> I eventually got my place in the lineup, mm -hmm. sort of. <laughs> Yeah, but it might be a good time to. Yeah, why don't we open up to the uh, to the audience? Uh, some questions for Jeff. Just comments. Or comments, questions, rebuttals. More, more, more childhood stories. Hopefully, less traumatic childhood <laughs> stories. Uh, Kim. Uh, but part of the problem is that there seems to be very little 
basis for a conversation when the very need for a conversation about race is questioned by or even rejected by the so called Trump voters, whatever you want. And, and so whatever conversation that does take place is between fairly like-minded people where there is a, a there's also a vast issue when you use certain words. Then the the perceived need to talk about race becomes an indicator of education, arrogance, class privilege, mm -hmm. uh, which is not altogether uh, an incorrect assumption. So there is a there are divides there that we liberals we are uh, a certain arrogance in how we see. The, the, the need for the conversation. I don't know if, if that makes sense. <laughs> Not really. Um, can you, I, I, an arrogance in, in sort of the perception that we need to have a discussion about race? Or yeah, I mean, uh, I think we all agree that that is needed, but we lack a uh, language to have that conversation. Not with each other, that's pretty straightforward. That also doesn't get us anywhere. We need a language to have a conversation with the people who don't see racism, who, who, who think structural, I mean, they, just using the term structural racism is alienating and shuts down the conversation. Of course, uh, only arrogant libtards use that language. So, how do we engage the people who really need to have? really need to have a conversation with it. When you don't actually have a common language, mm. how do you talk about race when people don't believe, so don't understand so, so, how racist they are? Sort of a functioning of the intellectual siloism that's going on in America that, you know, it's documented in social media is really reinforcing that we get media sources from sources we agree with. Mm -hmm. So how, how to bridge that um, when, for, I think I got Kim right, it, to, to even start the conversation is um, to force a viewpoint upon those who are denying that there's the need for a conversation. Well, I mean, I think they're forcing a viewpoint on us right now, you know? Um, Muslim ban, build the wall, that's all racialized, that's all race, right? So that's, that's a discussion that's being forced upon us. I think, listen, like Obama decided very early on, early on that the way to have a conversation about race was to uh, try to appeal to the goodness of white folks. This is ta Coates' argument, and I think that that's actually uh, very valid in many ways, right? And in so many ways, uh, folks still rejected that, you know? He would, honest, he would you know, try to speak honestly as often that he, as he could, but he would also use his, his bully pulpit to lecture um, African Americans about what they weren't doing correct. And that was a way to appeal to a lot of, of folks that he thought, um, white folks that he thought might like then listen to him when he was talking about inequity and these types of questions and issues, right? The reality is, is that in his second term, uh, many folks within the administration were able to push through policies that move the needle around inequity, around racial inequity. But a lot of times it had to happen under the radar, right? And so the, the lack of a conversation um, is, is, is coming from one side. It's a, the, the backlash that we see with, with Trump is basically that side edging in to take over the, conver the conversation at this particular point. So I, I think it has nothing to do necessarily with the kind of language that we're using. We could be using language up here on this particular stage. I, I also have a, a, a strong sense that where I'd be going out and doing door knocking or organizing or that kind of stuff, I'd be using much different language, right? Um, that the language that I'm gonna be using to my students to understand these types of kinds of structures that are happening and the histories that put them into place is going to be different from the kind of stuff that we'd be using to, to, to move the ballot, right? To move the ballot box with initiatives or, or those kinds of things. But what I think um, is, is allowed is 
is uh, the kind of uh, language, the kind of um, frames that have um, that have basically maintained this sort of status quo forever and ever and ever. And I think that that's a lot of why um, Trump is seen as normal to many voters, right? Um, and so, I, you know, these debates are happening at all these different levels at once. They're happening at Twitter right now, even as we're talking, right? They're happening uh, on MSNBC and Fox News. They're happening in the media. They're happening in rooms like this all around the country, right? The folks who really changed the conversation over the last three or four years was social movements, was Occupy, was Movement for Black Lives, were the Dreamers, you know, were the Standing Rock folks, were the Women's Marchers. Like, these are the folks who are changing the kind of conversation that we are having. And they don't necessarily have impacts right away. That's, I think, the other thing that, that we've learned from the way that culture shifts, right? Is that sometimes it takes a while for these things to be able to gain sort of credence to, to sort of gain a critical type of mass. But if we hadn't had Occupy, then you wouldn't have had Bernie Sanders. You wouldn't have you wouldn't even had Trump actually without Occupy, right? Because they move the whole discussion around economic justice to a whole different type of level, right? And so I I trust that that when folks are moving en masse, that things are shifting, right? And that what we need to do is to be able to continue to lift those types of things up in all the places that we are and, and, and be, right? Where we work, where we live, where we are, uh, are organizing, uh, where we write, uh, and all those kinds of things. And I, I, I look at that as, as, a change, as, as a change model. Um, earlier you talked a little bit about um, the spring of uh, cultural centers around universities. Um, so I have a friend who, um, she's a queer woman, and she was assaulted on this campus uh, with a while ago, those was a while ago. And she reported it, and they told her, you know, go to the Pride Center, they'll call you. And she also was a campus employee. And they told her the same thing, and she couldn't deal with it, she couldn't really find much support, so she ended up quitting her job. Um, so, like, I was wondering, this is sort of a two part question. I was wondering, do you think that cultural centers do a disservice towards not having a zero tolerance policy on, like, racist incidents or homophobic incidents? And also, for your top five NCs. <laughs> <laughs> That's the harder question, the top five NCs. But, the, the, the first question is difficult enough. I think, I'll put it this way, I would rather campuses have cultural centers than not. Um, I don't think that structures in and of themselves, structures are neutral. We put structures in, they are peopled by the people who are in there. Um, and the leadership or lack of leadership is, is evident given you know, what the actions are of those people who are, are keeping that particular structure. Um, so I would rather have the structures in place for that to be able to happen. But you know, like University of Missouri, right, um, has and had all these structures in place. You know, and yet you still have racist smearing feces across, you know, uh, the the uh, the black you know student union, right? You still have um, racial incidents. You still have people being beaten. Um, you still had a woman who was raped at, at Missouri, a black woman who was raped, who was completely ignored. Um, and, you know, and so, you know, at Stanford, we have all of these structures in place to deal with sexual assault, but Brock Turner still happened, right? Um, so the, the structures in and of themselves are not um, going to save us. Like, we have to basically be in there to... To, to be working it, and I think that, that that's, that's ultimately where the rubber meets the road. But the other part of it, which is real, is that um, universities um, have to be able to, to recognize the importance of these um, institutions and fund them and support them um, and lift them up um, as much as possible. Um, and, and I think that that's 
not necessarily been happening uh, across the board. Um, so I, I, that's sort of how I'd answer that, that particular question. Top five and C's is so difficult because it's always changing. Um, and I mean, I would definitely say um, that that De La Soul is my favorite group of all time, um, and that uh, the folks who are kind of giving me life right now are are, are not just MCs but uh, producers and musicians. So people like um, people like you know uh, Kendrick, of course, but also other folks from LA like Flying Lotus and you know Kamasi Washington are. Uh, the the Knowles sisters are giving me a lot of life right now. So that's five. It's not the top five of all time, but <laughs> I have to be. Uh, two very short questions. Both of you can answer. But I just wanted to respond to this question very shortly, if I may. Uh, I feel like having a conversation with each other is very important, but we need to have a conversation with ourselves and uh, creating more uh, music, uh, art, another form of communication that just progressive but also digestible and palatable uh, to make folks think. And what I realize the conversations we are having with each other is through a lot of anger, just attacking each other for the beliefs, which is very understandable. Uh, but you can't wake up that way. If someone is quote unquote sleeping, you barge into the room and tell them to wake up and clean the, the house, they're gonna say, fuck you, and go back to sleep. And that's all we've been seeing. Uh, but when more and more folks are uh, coming into the house and cleaning it, I believe that individual will wake up and understand the importance of picking up a room. That's that. Um, two questions I feel like we should all be asking ourselves, as you may answer. Um, uh, how do you heal and how do you resist? Um, healing is so critical. We're, we're actually doing a, a big class this year, um, in this quarter, um, on the question of healing and creativity, which I think belong together. Um, because what we've seen has been um, that you know people engaged in change work um, often there's an ethic of go to your broke or broken I should say right and um, and so we have to be able to create and foster places for for people to be able to revitalize and renew themselves um, and to a large extent art is that place I think. Um, Certainly for me, I uh, have been um, somebody who has moved steadily towards the arts uh, as, as I got older and older, um, recognizing that that was sort of the way for me to be able to stay in it. You know, that, um, that being able to, 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 to be somebody who could work on, on art Right, and also to to um, live around artists and work around artists uh, would be the way that I would be able to restore myself periodically to, to continue to do the work. Um, and and so so I think that the healing and creativity pieces really, really go together. Um, and and within that, you know, it's it's about trying to build a life of of resistance, but. Resistance isn't the end of it. Resistance is the beginning of it. Transformation is really the, the end of it, right? And, and so it's about transformation of oneself, but transforming the conditions as well, right? So the person that, that has been really influential on, on my work, I think, in the recent years has been Grace Lee Boggs. And what she says is that the revolution is not about this thing of taking one set of folks in power and overturning it and putting another group of folks in power. It's about transforming the idea of power itself. So it's about the relations that we have to each other. And it's about sort of uh, thinking about what it is that we want to exert from within ourselves um, into the world, right? Um, and then to do that together with, with other folks who are like-minded. So that it's about changing consciousness ultimately. And in that regard, um, Transformation is the revolution, as opposed to um, bloodshed and like one for the other and all this other kind of stuff. It's really about thinking about how we create the world that we want to actually live in, um, and that's like ultimately something that starts here with your values 
and then it, it goes out into the work that you do. Um, and it, 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 it's something that can only be done uh, communally. It can only be done in, in conjunction with others, um, in dialogue and discussion and you know, um, change with others. So, do you, do you see arts as an avenue for empathy? Yeah, and I think empathy isn't the end either, right? So empathy is the beginning. Yeah. Isn't the end either. Empathy is the beginning of it. Empathy, so yeah, arts absolutely is uh, being able to, it is the space of being able to try to create um, an opening for somebody to be able to inhabit your shoes, your yourself, your outlook on the world. But empathy is not the end. It's, it, it's reciprocity is the end, right? Mutuality is the end. So the end of it is is not the, the, the thing of I'm be, beginning to feel what you feel. It's the we're working together to transform. That's what the end is of it all. Questions? Yeah, I just like to know um, what are your thoughts on I mean, moving forward the necessity or the transformation in ethnic study departments? I understand that you know in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was just a fight just to have an Asian American Studies program or an African American Studies program. But one of the things is there's a separation between history programs or English programs or sociology. At what point do you see ethnic studies programs gradually moving over towards more of the, I guess, quote unquote, mainstream programs, or do you see you know, them keeping in place and preserving and strengthening them? I think there's a place for, I mean, there's a place for both, right? So the, the ethnic studies revolution began as community studies you know, ultimately it was about trying to um, create places where knowledge could be built so that people could serve the communities. And, and I think that that function is still crucial, it's still central. Um, and yet, so many programs and departments have moved away from that, actually, in the process of professionalizing. Um, you know, the, 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 ultimately, it's the process of sort of taking on the logic of the bureaucracy that you're working with. Them. And I think that far too many of the programs and departments have unfortunately fallen into that kind of a trap. Um, and so there's, I think that that's part of what ethnic studies needs to go back to, is to understand um, the, and, and really hold this notion of developing knowledge uh, of, for, by communities, right? Um, so that's the first part. Um, the second part is is that all of this should be knowledge for everybody, right? So, so the relationship between ethnic studies and the sort of quote unquote mainline disciplines, um, it should be fluid. And I think that some campuses have, have made, um, a number of universities have sort of made that part of the process, whether through joint appointments, you know, like a professor coming in would have to be situated, say, in one department, as well as ethnic studies, or through processes by which research gets shared, or people are creating study groups, or those kinds of things, informal or informally and formally, right? Um, but ultimately, the argument is that this is all knowledge that everybody should have, period. Right? So, so uh, that evolution, I think, is happening within the structures of knowledge production that are, are set up now. Um, where we need to, to, to be um, sort of vigilant is to think about the, the ways that these two kinds of functions work together, right? And so by staying accountable to the communities, that I think reinforces and uh, increases the, 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 uh, the value and the production of the knowledge that is then being moved into these quote unquote disciplines, right? And it's also a way to be able to avoid, or at least have a, a space from which you can, you can sort of work from um, to avoid uh, the, the idea of being sort of brought in and absorbed and sort of, you know, flattened out, eased out, you know what I mean, sort of like, um, smoothed out, right? Um, so we haven't done a good job, I think, over the last 40 years of actually 
making that work within the institutions that we have. Um, and I think that that's the, the, the structural thing that we need to do uh, over the next you know, 10, 20 years. With everything that's been talked about tonight, all of the subjects and topics that have come up, I was curious to know what you think the next generation needs to be the most aware of to be able to join this conversation without slowing it down anymore. What we need to look at and be very cognizant of to be able to be productive members and help this conversation along. So, you know, I, the, the two major questions I think that face those of you who are in your 20s and 30s are the climate justice question, climate change, right? This is like the ultimate intersectional issue. Everybody's gonna be involved in this, right? One way or the other. Um, and so everybody's gotta figure this out together. With the folks who are on the front lines um, at the head of that. You know? So communities in the Pacific, communities uh, such as those in Alaska, right? Kivalina and these different types of places where they're literally underwater because of this. People who are in Africa who are experiencing severe drought. Like these are the communities that should be shaping and leading that particular discussion. But it's intersectional. We all have to come together to be able to figure this out. Um, on, a, on a sort of smaller level, but still very large level, the main question is if we're all going to be minorities, how do we figure out how to build a new forward thinking majority? Right? And we're failing at that right now, right? Electorally, I think we're failing at that. I think intellectually, we might be in a different place. We might be actually a lot better off than we think we are. Um, but sort of electorally, absolutely, we're failing that now, you know? Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's, it's gonna require folks to be able to get into this conversation, to get into this question of who holds power, who holds privilege, um, and what does it look like if that's given up, if that's shared, if that's distributed, right? And what kind of future can be uh, fair for everyone? And it be begins ultimately with a simple type of thing, an exchange, right? If we can figure out how in all of the things that we do, right, and all the people that we interact with, we can develop exchanges that are not exploitative and extractive, but that are egalitarian, right? And then we can build that out to thinking about community, thinking about how that, that works in terms of building out societies and stuff, then we'll have figured it out. But ultimately, the, the question of, of building a majority um, that is open and inclusive and equitable is, is the one that faces us as a country. Questions? Yeah, this one. Uh, I have a question conversation. Uh, so I was thinking about what you were saying earlier. Um, you said uh, using political correctness as a way to silence those that want to call out racism, homophobia, etc. Um, and uh, the conversation has stalled the discussion. Uh, and then Kim was asking, um, about the language that we use to, to really engage in a conversation. Um, and so I was thinking about, about these, these ideas and, and then what you were saying about uh, starting in, in the community. And I think that there is, um, that the conversation has stopped and that we are lacking a language because, yeah, we have the language to, to discuss these, these great ideas uh, in our ivory towns, you know, and, and in our echo chambers where we have, like you were saying, like our media sources that are aligning with our beliefs that we share with our group of people that also align with our beliefs. And then, next thing you know, um, so-and-so's aunt on Facebook says something that you disagree with, and then all of your friends completely shut down. Um, and that happens on countless. Um, social media sites, and I think that that is where, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think that that is where, where we are really lacking the language to interact, to talk about uh, these ideas, because uh, I have a member of my family, for instance, who is a 
a strong voter. And, uh, and it's really frustrating because she'll say, oh, I'm not a racist, but da 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 And, uh, and so, so and, and you know, she'll bring in these, these token ideas or whatever, and everybody knows that person. Um, but I think if we work to, at what point do we work to create a language? I suppose, and uh, uh, insofar as like, okay, you might not think you're a racist. These are signs of racism in the community. <laughs> Do, you know, like, at what, like, we're not trying to, are we, I guess, are we trying to convince racists that they're racist, first of all? Second of all, at what point do we coax them and, uh, and kind of pet their ego and say, you know, I know you didn't vote for Trump because you're racist. I know that you think that the white middle or that the middle class is being squeezed out. And so like, let's talk about corporatism and then eventually kind of edge around eventually to the idea of race. But is that being too gentle? Like at what point do these explosive discussions actually need to happen? Mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, these are people that we care about, um, that we want to be able to empathize with us and that we also are trying to empathize with. And so I think that there is a, a language disconnect. Um, I mean, it's, I literally had the conversation that you, that you see in The Big Lebowski where someone says Oriental and say, whoa, man, it's not a preferred nomenclature. <laughs> so like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, there's, I, I'm definitely hearing like your, your pain in terms of trying to work with your family member here on this. Um, there's, you know, there's calling out and there's calling in. Sometimes calling out serves a really good function, you know, uh, and that could be to shame a person into, into doing better, right? Um, sometimes you have to call in, and calling in means um, allowing some of that stuff to pass through the filter and finding the point at which you connect, right? Um, and then, and, and so that is uh, a much more of a difficult kind of thing, you know. But it, it's it, it's about trying to find that exchange. It's not about performing it for somebody out there who's like, you're not demonstrating woke enough, you know, types of tendencies here in calling out or not calling out your your auntie, right? It's about trying to find if you're really sincere about trying to figure out how to call in your auntie, like trying to find that connection. There. Right, and so that's a little bit different than the notion of of everybody piling on on Facebook um, or on Twitter or something like that, where it's partly performance, right? It's partly about like like oh wow, yeah, like your your folks are so wrong. We just we're just gonna like we're just gonna show you how they, how wrong they were, you know? Um, and that's or, that's just fundamental organizing. That's community organizing. At its most basic, right? Trying to find that exchange, um, and I think the other thing to note is that some people you're just not gonna win. You're just not. You know what I mean? You're just not gonna win. You're never gonna win them. They're always gonna believe what they're gonna believe. You know, and and at that point, it's it's really about do you have the time to organize all the folks you're never gonna get organized. You know, or do you move on to the folks that you can? You know what I mean? Because some people might come, 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 come around by virtue of the fact that you went around them. You know, or, but, or they might never come around, and that might be the reality that 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 sets in. You know, but this is the question I think, aggregate-wise, right, about trying to think about what the new majority would look like. Right, we're not going to get everybody. There's still going to be the folks out there who are the Dylan Roof types, right? There's going to be those types of folks. It's just reality, right? What we're trying to do is to minimize the harm that they cause and maximize the good that, that we can do for, for people, for everyone. And that's the ultimate goal. And so, you know, think about it next time that you, you, you sort of might be like thinking about jumping into a, a whole sort of situation here on social media, right? Like, oh, okay, well, I got you, okay, that's good, then you already know. 
But I, you know, that's it's it's I I like I want to sometimes. I just have to be like, oh no, I'm just gonna close this window right now and move on to the next thing. Yeah, because I got a lot of other things I can do this day. So, yeah. yeah, I had a question about um, what do you think it is about hip hop that seems to have some kind of resonance with the colonial experience, especially in the past decade, where you see the rise of hip hop in places like Johannesburg or Hong Kong or Paris or, or Afghanistan and so forth. And one thing that I always think about is that scene from Three Kings. When George Clooney, they rolled into that bombed out Iraq village, and they got the boombox, and it's Iraqi hip hop coming down through the stereo. Mm -hmm. And do you see, I mean, if you, you mentioned some of this in, in Can't Stop, Won't Stop, and a lot of change since then. What are some of those changes that you see? And, and do you see, is there something also commercial about that spread of hip hop, too, that's almost ghoulish, you know, where it's almost seems like they're exploiting the image of hip hop in the way that we talk about that scene? Yeah. I mean, hip hop. You know, hip hop is is a it's a movement that started from kids who are completely abandoned, completely forgotten, who um, were trying to make a way to have fun. You know, and and so and it's despite itself, it's retained all of that. You know, um, basic sort of essence in a way. You know, so at its at, at its most ineffable, at its most sort of like, you know, ground up, it's that. It's just somebody finding their voice, right? Or finding their movement, finding their body, right? Um, and in that way, it's like all of the best art, right? And all the best art can be used for whatever purposes it might be used for. And it can be used for commercial purposes. Um, and uh, and sometimes the commercial uh, aspects of things will spread the, the sort of germinal ideas that are within it, right? So that, you know, the fact that hip hop got put onto a record, as opposed to just being an experience that you had in the park, allowed suddenly kids around the world to be able to be exposed to, like, this thing that they could find their voice to, right? Um, that you know the commercial stuff could be there it could also be a type of thing that obscures um different types of things or enhances the kinds of antisocial or maybe regressive non-progressive types of aspects that you that you you know would not want to see being spread um and you know so so it's it's neutral in that regard but i think that at the base it's literally just folks trying to find their voice find a, trying to find their bodies Try to find a place, and and because it's remained that kind of thing, it's dynamic. It hasn't died, despite numerous reports of its death, right? By many folks within within hip hop itself, um, it continues to evolve and it continues to to change and it continues to represent in many ways. Could you, could you say something about hip hop and authenticity? And I think that that's like. I saw a t-shirt one time, and it said, hip-hop hip is uh, punk rock for black people. <laughs> and both punk and hip-hop have this insistence on authenticity. Yeah. And I know there's things between hip-hop and rapping, right? And what really is hip-hop? And what, what's, what's, you know, we got the hip-hop guy here, so what's, <laughs> what's in that uh, constant self-checking on authenticity? And is that separated from other arts? Yeah, I, I don't know if it separates it from other eyes. I mean, there's there's all that de debate about what's real punk and what's not, right? Is this is this punk? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, almost punk the same debate, right? Yeah, it's the same. It's an aesthetic debate, but it's also, I think, a way of of folks being able to to say this is the power of of it, of hip hop, right? Let's not lose that. And and so these debates pop up in an aesthetic ways, like over and over again. You know, like literally every every couple of weeks. You know. Um, every every couple of days, sometimes you know, um, and I mean, but you know, ultimately, um, what it is is it's it's a it's a movement that began from Afro diaspora Afro diaspora roots um, in North America and specifically in the Bronx uh, in the 1970s, but with these roots going back thousands of years um, and these communication forms and mythologies and all these different types of 
of, of forms of expression that have been channeled through the African uh, and African American experience all through the years. And because it's ultimately um, been open um, and been opened up by its, its um, practitioners, um, it's become available for folks um, all around the world. Um, and so the, 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 the ways in which um, this freedom culture um, creates possibilities of, of freedom for other, of other people um, is I think one of the great, um, it's just really one of the great phenomena, it's cultural phenomena of, of history period, you know. Um, that the black freedom struggle and the black freedom culture has been able to create these freedom pathways for, for so many people around the world. Um, and I think that, that ultimately um, where we take that is, is, is up to us. If we honor, if we're able to honor the roots and the, the trajectory and the vectors of that struggle and that movement, um, then we'll, we, we have a shot at gaining freedom for everyone. So, um, yeah, one more question, please. Yes, uh, um, no, back to the whole uh, concept of race and transformation and things like that, I guess my question is, once you transform uh, into a more forward-thinking, progressive majority, uh, based, you know, on history, things like that, social reformations have sometimes an ironic tendency to be cyclical, where the newly installed majority then becomes the very oppression or ignorance they were on. Yeah. So how do we as a society progress beyond that point Bypass that cyclical ignorance. I want to interrupt and say, read, read the last essay in the latest book uh, with these reflections on Asian American identity and Asian American politics, and that vignette, the, the schools in San Francisco, that, that totally nails it. So. Yeah. But but then, buy the book, read it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that pu uh, push. Um, but the, there's also an essay after that that actually talks about Beyonce. And then the book ends with Beyonce because there's nothing to say after Beyonce. Um, but the, but the, the point is, is that there's no end, right? It's, the struggle is, is, is ongoing. As long as you're alive, you're struggling, right? As long as an idea is alive, we need to struggle for it, right? So there's no end. You don't reach some sort of a promised land of paradise on earth, and then it's done, and everybody's good, right? And I think that that's sort of... The problem, and I think it's also sort of what Grace is referring to with all of these theories that posited some sort of end of history. There's no end of history. You continue to make history, right? So we continue to, to work and work and work at this, um, even through it all, right? Um, that's part of Grace's dialectical understanding of history, right? That, that that we're still sort of trying to figure it all out, even when it seems to have been figured out. Um, but we're actually never really there in some ways, you know? And that's also the meaning of life, too. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, on that note, uh, please join me giving uh, Jeff a big mahalo from Sac State.